Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Good Times with Crazy Friends. <laughs> Today we are speaking with Richard Stuverud. Gesundheit myself. <laughs> Richard has an impossibly long and impressive resume, but just to highlight a few. Herr Stuverud was the drummer of the Fast Backs, and he is the man who gets the tap on the shoulder when Herr Ament needs some skins laid down. More germane to this conversation, however, Richard is an ultra-talented and highly accomplished songwriter in his own right. I found his recent album Memories in Kodachrome, which I poured through with a fine toothed comb, so very delectable, that I just had to have him on for a good old-fashioned songwriter mind meld deep dive. That was hard to say. I hope you enjoy this, and I am truly humbled and honored to bring you my very fun conversation with Mr. Richard Stewart. All right, Richard, let me tell you what. Um, thank you for joining me today, and also thank you for sending me your record here, uh, Memories in Kodachrome. This is a beautiful record. And double, quadru double quadruple thank you for sending me this single. This is special. I, I, this is going in my special section. Yeah, I figured a little bit of physical copy, you know, is important in this day and age of uh, the digital realm, you know. Uh, vinyl. It, it, I'm going to try and put, put out the record in vinyl. Or uh, perhaps my forthcoming, uh, hopefully we'll get some more vinyl going. So. Wow, wow. that's going to lead really nicely into one of my questions. Um, but speaking of questions... <laughs> Um, I gave your record two listens with a fine tooth comb and, you know, and I'm sure you can attest when you listen to records and when I listen to records as a songwriter, I think we listen to them a little bit differently than maybe most people listen to records. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and what I mean by that particularly is I look at songwriting as um, a set of decisions. So before you write a song, it could be anything. It's infinity <laughs> possibilities. Right. And you start with one thing and you're presented with five options and you pick one. Mm -hmm. You're presented with five and you pick one. Um, and so that's what, how I listened to your record and I really enjoyed it from that standpoint as well as from an, a nice to listen to standpoint as well. Oh, nice. Uh, but my, my first question for you is, how many instruments do you play with um, well enough to be able to write songs on that instrument? Yeah, so uh, outside of being a drummer primarily, uh, my next instrument, my go-to instrument was piano, which is connected to drumming, obviously, with a rhythm component. Um, the guitar kind of came much later, and it's a little bit uh, it's funny because I can only play guitar in open tuning, and I'm lefty, left-handed, and I'm not even playing proper chords, so it's super unorthodox. I'm actually kind of embarrassed about that. Um, but the weird thing with open tuning and just the one finger bar chord, I get this shimmering sound and because the guitar is upside down and I, I don't even restring it the other way. So I don't know if Hendrix, I know Hendrix was lefty. I'm not sure if he strung it properly, but he uh, did. He okay. did. That's why his, his headstock is upside down because yeah. Um, yeah. Because so, he switched and strung it right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, um, the guitar kind of came later, and um, so I think songwriting, you know, really came to me early on via piano. Um, and then with the guitar, it was pretty interesting where I would get this shimmering sound. And, and of course, I'm really fortunate to um, have so many amazing guitarists in my life where I can actually, you know, demo a song with my kind of hack open tuned. Uh, and what's funny is most of the response from most of the guitar players I work with, they're like, hey, you know, that's your sense of rhythm because you're a drummer, that's solid. And uh, sometimes it's kind of hard to hear the differential, you know, the chord changes with that open tuning. But um, nonetheless, I'm super grateful to have like some real guitar players kind of, uh, you know, put me in the right direction. So, yeah, basically drums, piano, guitar. And I've uh, been lately getting into synths and, of course, been singing. You know, singing is sort of synonymous with piano. My experience, you know, playing piano, it just it comes naturally in that regard. So, yeah. <laughs> and as just a quick offshoot of that question, what's your favorite open tuning? Well, I'm going to have to say C, open C. And the, open the C. Open C, the reason... Uh, uh, see, I kind of go back and forth because open D, 
I think Keith Richards was kind of into the open D, right? It's a toss up between C and D. But one reason I brought D is, um, you know, I'm a huge George Harrison fan. I mean, I'd struggled with, okay, who's my favorite Beatle? And, you know, it was always kind of bouncing around from Lennon and Ringo, just, you know, drummer and kind of the feisty side of the Beatles, you know. Um, and McCartney, undeniably, you know, amazingly talented. Uh, but George Harrison had this thing. And uh, I briefly studied tabla when I lived in Philadelphia from a tabla master. And um, because of my, like, connection with resonating with George Harrison songs, those early Beatle records, uh, well, actually, uh, Revolver, for instance, Tomorrow Never Knows, or, like, the songs that uh, have that kind of drone, the Indian, you know, the East Indian element of classical yeah. Indian music. So I'm really attracted to that drone. And so I've actually, I probably overuse it in a lot of my songwriting, but I just gravitate to uh, an element of the tuning that that has that drone. And so open C, open D, and a lot of the ragas, like Ravi Shankar, for instance, you know, those those rogs will be in like uh, open C, open C sharp. So, you know, the, the, the Tampura instrument just does the drone. And uh, so it's uh, pretty interesting. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <clears throat> That's awesome. Um, okay. I know there's lots of answers to this question, but just whatever comes to mind, um, I, I want to ask you about... I want to ask you about the first spark, like when you know you have something you need to sit down and work on. For, for instance, do you sit down and say, OK, I'm going to write for 45 minutes now? or are you doing the dishes and something pops into your head and then you have to go work on it? How does that more often than not work for you? The very first moment you realize you have something you get to work on. Yeah, you know, I, that's a great question. I think I think it's sort of like there's an element of two things that happen. Um, I mean, just recently, uh, I woke up literally with this, uh, this riff in my head. And now granted, as a drummer, song, singer, songwriter, uh, my particular style, I'll have to say, I, I, I feel like my weakness on one level is coming up with like serious proper riffs, you know, like in the Jimmy Page vein or, you know, Iomi in, in Black Sabbath. But what I do get is that kind of strumming, you know, like the Jeff Lynn production on a Tom Petty's Full Moon Fever, you know, like just that, mm -hmm. that thing comes naturally to me. And then that might be a little more simple, you know, simplified thing. But um, just recently I woke up with this riff and I just did the, the voice of what I think the guitar should do. Sent it to my buddy in LA, uh, Neil Walter by the name, great guitarist. And um, he came back two hours later with, with a, you know, a demo of the riff. And it was just like really funny. So I'm kind of working on that uh, for a song at the moment. Um, and then there are moments when I do like just sit down and I think it does have this moment of spontaneity where I'll, I'll leave my acoustic in open D, maybe open E, um, and then maybe a, an electric in open C. And I could just walk through the house and just, you know, strum it without, you know, an actual chord. And um, and sometimes I'll just pick it up and just like the first thing that I stumble on, you know, can be can be like the, that spark. Um, when I wrote Not Afraid, um, I'll be honest, I was <clears throat> really uh, moved by Dave Grohl's writing. and But I didn't sit there. And consciously think, okay, I want to, I want to write a song like the Foo Fighters, but then again, Keith Moon is my favorite drummer, so I've got the Who element. So I may have been a little, you know, conscious of like trying to write a, a Who Fighters song, you know, like I was trying, <laughs> consciously thinking like, you know, both both of those <clears throat> musical entities kind of speak to me, and so that particular song, I think I sat down and kind of you know, had a, a preconceived idea of, you know, <clears throat> what I want to go for there. So, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, I love that method. And, and I think <clears throat> I, I do that sometimes. I sit down and say, I'm going to write an audio slave song, you, you know, oh, and yeah. 
truck, you know, or whatever, a Foo Fighters, whatever, because because no matter what you do, you can't write a Foo Fighters song. You're not the Foo Fighters, but right. you can write you can write a Richard song or a Ryan song that has a lot of the pleasantries of the you know in, in the vein of, and then it, it's its own thing. I love well, I love that, all the yeah. That's a really good point, Ryan. Uh, you know, a few times I've been a little self conscious in the studio. Uh, not all the time, but just, you know, I, I sort of look at like, okay, drums is my main instrument. When I go into the songwriting thing, it, it is a little more humbling. Um, but I've mentioned like, oh man, I'm, I really, you know, God, I kind of envy, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, what's his name uh, from Screaming Trees? Uh, I can't think of the name right now. Is that Mark, Le- Mark? Mark Lanigan. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, need more coffee um yeah Good like morning. i'll think about mark lanigan's voice and you know i'll tell like an engineer or another musician i'm working with in the studio man i just really wish i could just capture that voice and you know one of my favorite engineers here in oakland uh and he's like no no it's you know your voice is you, you, this this is the, the a richard thing you know don't, don't worry too much about like that uh, the other aesthetic you know so yeah that's cool point that you brought up there <clears throat> absolutely I, I would like to get into the nitty-gritty um now and speaking of the tom petty um aesthetic uh what better way to start a a record than eight measures of one strum of a d chord <laughs> right? <laughs> right i loved it Sh- shameless awesomeness um but then in <clears throat> that first song american spirits you go into a seven eight riff Mm-hmm. Um, and there's two instances that I caught in your record uh, memories in cro- in Kodachrome where you used funky time signatures, and by that I mean anything other than three or four, you know, right. for the people right. for the folks watching. And my question for you is, how generally does that work? As a drummer, do you kind of naturally feel seven eight, or do you write something in four and go, ah, you know what, we we've got you know twelve <laughs> songs in in four or three. Maybe we should spice one of them up or two of them up yeah. with a seven or a five or something. How does that work for you? Yeah, well, that's a great. That's also a great observation. Um, I'll have to. I have to bring up Jeff Immense's name uh, because I feel like when Jeff and I started uh, playing together, off and on in between Pearl Jam and and other elements, I remember Jeff and the, you know part of the rhythm section uh, deal here. Um, you know trying things in seven eight and you know when i look back at some early seattle moments with Soundgarden doing some odd time signatures you know i think as a drummer i've always been kind of fascinated with you know going there and um i feel like on one level as a rock drummer i feel like i can kind of grasp uh you know those those moments those time signature moments and um and then a lot of times I'm humble in the sense that, okay, you know, how far down the rabbit hole you want to go to where it gets almost like fusion and jazz fusion. I mean, it's pretty wild. It's, it's incredible. Um, so I just kind of, you know, skim the surface of that time signature. And I think when I started feeling more confident as a songwriter, when I started to actually apply certain elements of like dropping the beat to do seven, eight, uh, that, that, became, that really opened things up. That was really pretty awesome. I mean, I, you know, awesome feeling to feel like you're. And then there's moments where it, you can, I, for me, I, I'm able to kind of draw the line, like, okay, you know. And other guitarists that I really respect, uh, I have another project here in Oakland that I play with, and uh, you know, the guitarist is is fully aware of those time signatures, and he'll um he'll kind of remind me, like, ah, you know, that's that's pretty good, right? Kind of where you're going there. I think if you go too much further you know you might lose the groove and i think there's some tr- truth to that you know but uh jeff was definitely early on he, he would he would try a lot of his writing too will will go in that vein and and so it's been pretty influential you know but um i think with not afraid that is a good example um that that melody line i think it, it really just it naturally just felt like i could go back and forth from four four and seven eight you know so cool observation on your part. Awesome. <laughs> oh, thank thank you. And I'll just give you kudos here. This doesn't need a response unless you want to respond. But in American Spirits, the first track on your record here, I'm holding it up in hopes everyone who's watching this goes to check it out. <laughs> uh, the first track, American Spirits, it served uh, to kind of make the vocals string together in um, 
you know, there could have been a pause after that last syllable, but there wasn't a pause because he took a beat out and it made the vocals kind of connect in what I perceived to be like a circle. And then at the end of each phrase of several seven, eight phrases, you relaxed into four, which was also a very lovely moment. On the other hand, on Star of David, I felt like um, it was kind of the post-chorus section, I believe, where you had, you know, sets of eight and then a set of two. And then yeah. the whole thing looped around again. Yeah. Um, and that served to me because I was doing a task. I was listening to your record and organizing some shelf. Um, oh. And I woke up in that <laughs> moment, you know, because it was like, doopy doopy doo, <laughs> ah, something different. And so that served to make, you know, jab me in the in the side and pay attention. Yeah. Um, yeah, that so. time signature at the end of Star David, that really was something that, you know, uh, was a first time for me. And the guitarist I brought in uh, to lay that down was really, he, he was super stoked about it. You know, and it, 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 uh, it, it came together. But, um, you know, one trick, too, that uh, holds things together, when you have an odd time on guitar, um, double time on drums can kind of tie it together in a way so, you, so the odd time doesn't really stand out too much because the double time is just kind of keeping it you know, somewhat connected. So I, I'll, I'll pull, I'll pull that out, you know, quite a few times, you know, um, but yeah, that's cool. Right on. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Great. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> um, okay. Here's a question about guitar solos um, in your, in your writing and how you view them. Um, the first guitar solo, and I'm making a distinction between the guitar part, which might be construed by some as a solo, and maybe by you from Loon Echo, um, which I look at more as a, a complementary musical part rather right. than a gu guitar solo. So by my definition, the first guitar solo on your record comes in the fifth track, House of Faith. Nice. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so you waited, uh, you waited five tracks to introduce the guitar solo and then had maybe a, the one, the aforementioned kind of part, kind of solo, and later in the record, kind of a half uh, solo, if I recall correctly, I don't remember yeah. which track. Um, <clears throat> how do you feel about guitar solos? Why so few, uh, especially given you have so many, you know, gu guitarist friends who I'm sure could supply you with yeah. any number of guitar solos, but why so few and how do you feel about guitar? When do you use a guitar solo? Yeah, I know. I feel like it's, that's a really interesting point. Um, I feel like I'm so immersed in like the sensibility of melody, like with the vocal melody. And that might be something out of my um, kind of fascination with power pop approach where it's just really super catchy uh, melody line. Like, like I'll sing a melody line in an intro and then like when a guitar, like a lot of times I'm thinking like that's what the guitar can do. And uh, and then you know super catchy vocal melody for yeah you know, the verse and chorus, and sometimes I'll return to an in, an intro that where a guitar is doing that really catchy melody line. So in a weird way, I might be making up for lack of guitar solo with those elements. Um, I wouldn't say I consciously avoid guitar solos, but then again, because of my own limitations. Um, and I'm, I'm so lucky to have so many guitarists, uh, on, on my recordings that, uh, yeah, it's just sort of like, I, I suppose it's all about like, if it's the right song for sure, you know, and, um, that reminds me, you know, in my forthcoming records, I'm going to have to have you lay down some wicked lead, Ryan, if you're down. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was I literally just popped into my head that I was going to mention that at the end, I would be honored to appear <laughs> on one of your on one of your forthcoming records. And hey, I, you know, I, I, I yeah. have to say, uh, I was checking out some of your videos and I really enjoyed uh, Twilight, uh, your your instruction for Twilight, um, Elliot Smith. God, that's like one of my favorite songs, you know. It's a beautiful, beautiful that, song, yeah. That, that album oh, is so amazing, but it was really cool to actually, okay, he's, he, he, look at this, look at these moves, you know, and uh, so I have a lot of respect. Actually, someone asked me, hey, what's your favorite thing about drumming? And you're going to love this. I, I, it's the guitar. I, I, I'm moved by loud guitars, you know, and it's sort of like what Hendrix did. And then you think of Mitch Mitchell complimenting Hendrix, you know, in that sort of vibe, you know. So that's my, that's what inspires me, you know, all around. 
Like, <laughs> That's awesome. Favorite thing about drumming is the guitar. <laughs> That's right. Spectacular. I love it. Yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. Here, here's something that, that I enjoyed very much about your record, and it's the title of the record. Uh, Memories in Kodachrome, um, but not the words, not the words of the title, but the fact that the title of the record is is kind of it's it's a main point of the song, the fourth song, uh, Loon Echo, but it's not like the and we're going to sing it every time in the chorus line. It's it's a setup line. It's a beautiful line. But right. It's a setup. It's a setup line, you know, hidden in the middle of Loon Echo, not even the main point of it or anything. Yeah. Um, it, is that. Um, yeah. How did how did you come? Uh, did you write the song first and then spot that lyric? Were you trying to fit those words in? a? How did this become? It's a double bait and switch, really. Yeah. You hit right. it. You, you, you hit it in a prominent spot, but not the prominent spot. And it becomes yeah. the title of your record. How did that come about? Right. Well, I, first of all, I should say that uh, this particular record was really interesting because I worked with a, a writer, a, a lyricist. So in essence, a lot of these songs, most of these songs, actually, uh, the lyricist uh, by the name of Derek McCulloch. And we shared a connection. Uh, our kids went to the same elementary school. And so really fortunate here in Oakland. I mean, just, just like other parents, everyone that's playing on my recordings, I mean, they're, they're fellow dads. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible. So much gratitude there. But uh, when I worked with Derek, he sent me a couple lyrics and it was the first time in my life where I was like looking at some other lyrics and then just like interpreting those lyrics. If, if there's a story to be told or, um, you know, whatever it is, a message that the, the lyrics in a way um, dictated like how I would approach the song. So for Loon Echo, uh, that particular song is about uh, Derek's uh, upbringing up in Canada. And um, so in, in a cool way, I was able to kind of like read his lyrics and then put myself in those lyrics. And I went right to the piano and uh, the memory in Kodachrome. Um, was in, in at the end of each uh, sort of like a pre-chorus, I believe. And I just thought, man, that's that's a great title, you know, just extrapolating like a lyric. Um, so, you know, that was pretty interesting uh, to kind of go there. Um, so that that's the one thing I think that makes this record pretty special, you know, um, just having that collaborative element. Um, and it's, it's also given me a lot more confidence to take a closer look at my own lyrics too like just to see if i can kind of cultivate that like almost like collaborate with myself in a weird way like okay there's a different part of the mind lyrics for me personally is the most challenging part of songwriting and so that sort of thing you know is, is, a, is a work in progress you know to get uh it's pretty easy Easy to kind of come up with cool chords and cool rhythms and, and then try to fit lyrics who <laughs> it's a tough one but yeah <clears throat> yeah the, the whole the whole rec the, the record struck me as you know mostly a storytelling record I, I there was there yeah. was a story in pretty much every song um right yeah <laughs> and so i i enjoyed the, the that the storytelling aspect of, of the record um and my last question for you richard mm -hmm. is uh it takes a lot of effort to make one of these i know <laughs> right right <laughs> Yeah. Well, what is your motivation to, to, you know, I don't know. It seems this is a recent release and you're already thinking about forthcoming records. Yeah. What yeah. is your motivation to put yeah. yourself through this? Yeah. You know, it's really interesting because I, I sort of feel like um, in between playing with different bands, you know, playing a couple bands here in Oakland, uh, one called Wrecked, uh, one called Slow Phase. And um, and then pursuing my solo career I've never really you know thought to uh I, I I never really thought about going full on you know with the singer songwriter mode so I in a way it's kind of like this self-discovery as a drummer really uh to just see if I can kind of push things and I think like when certain projects also is kind of the end of you know uh some of the side projects with jeff and whatnot and and then covid kind of hitting it kind of sort of made this different approach 
And um, I feel like, you know, a little more isolation has been uh, sort of what's behind like the idea of just being a little more prolific. I'm currently going through some old uh, recording, like old demos and just, you know, thinking like I can kind of dust that off and, uh, and just keep putting out music. Maybe it, it is kind of this cathartic deal, you know? Um, and so I think the timing, you know, you know, everything is, is pretty, you know, bizarre time, <laughs> you know, at the moment. So I think like as cliche as it sounds, it's like, ah, it's like music, making music, recording it, writing it, recording it is just so precious to me, you know, and I do pine for the days of playing shows and being on tour, but, you know, recording and writing, that's just, that's my favorite thing on the planet. <laughs> um, that's awesome. It's that you have to do it. You can't not do it. Is exactly. What I mean. You know, I, that's what I feel like, you know, I, I used to think that like as musicians, you know, we think about our instruments, right. And it's like, that's what we play. And, and, you know, another cliche is kind of like, I just feel like ah, that, that's actually who we are. Like, you know, writing songs and trying to record them and just get them out. It's just something that, you know, it's not, it's not something I'm doing. It's something that just, I, you know, I am like, I'm just going to keep doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, I can, you know, I can attest to that and teaching, you know, full time for all the, all the years that I taught um, 15 of them. Um, yeah. I don't even feel like there's a thing in my hand. I just feel like it is me that, that, that yeah. instrument, you know, it is me. And I, and it doesn't, when I'm listening, it feels like I'm looking, you know, because what you're really doing is paying attention. That's what looking at something is, right? So when I'm listening, yeah. it feels like looking. And when I'm playing, it feels like speaking. Um, Amazing. So, yeah. yes. Yeah, I can attest to that, you know, teaching myself, uh, uh, teaching uh, at the School of Rock uh, here in Berkeley. And then I have some private uh, students. And uh, it's one of some of the most rewarding moments I've ever had, you know, like I have a couple of young vocal students and, you know, we're just getting into like the idea of songwriting and just, you know, to hear, you know, a kindergartner, a, a first grader, just I'll, I'll, I'll lay a three chord thing down and then they're coming up with lyrics and singing is, ah, it's too good. You know, it's like kind of, kind of reminds you of, of how important, you know, this is, you know, keeping things creative and, so uh, yes, <clears throat> amazing. I think that's the perfect yeah. uh, that's the perfect message to wrap up on, Richard. It is yeah. so nice to meet you. Thank nice you so you. much. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. I think everyone yeah. uh, will really enjoy that. Thanks for and, having uh, me, Ryan. Thanks for having I'm, me. And uh, my, uh, some of the best questions I've heard this year. Wait a minute. The last couple of years. No. <laughs> no. Really, really great. Awesome. Thank you so much.